Welcome to July webinar, uh, Telco Cloud uh, Evolution. Uh, for for those, uh, for the colleagues who, who are meeting me for the first time, uh, my name is uh, Karim. I'm an ICT uh, architect. Uh, my main background is, is Teleco, uh, but I would say since 2015, uh, uh, I'm focusing, I've been focusing on the uh, cloud and orchestration, mainly for Telecos. Uh, mo most of the slides will have some sort of telco theme, so you will see uh, like uh, some sort of cloud part, but also always bringing the telco part. So I'm trying to stitch the the end to end picture. Um, I have also some some contributions on on some of the uh, uh, communities related to uh, to cloud to to NFV, uh, some work with ITU related also to uh, uh, to five G. We are going to start the webinar. Uh, please feel free to, to, if you have any questions or any comments, please use the Q&A uh, tool. Uh, I'll try to stop uh, like each, uh, every, uh, like every now and a few minutes or a few slides, I, I will stop and see the, the Q&A. And the questions are very important. It, it's already actually a part of the webinar. So please feel free to, to post your questions. So today I'm, I'm bringing uh, almost uh, 13 slides about the topic of tech cloud evolution. So I'm going to give you an overview about uh, the, the, the Telco Cloud concept, how did it start, how did it evolve, what are the stage that we are in now, and what are we heading uh, to. So I would say I have two main sections. Uh, something uh, talks about the as-is setup that we, we see now. And then I'm talking about the evolution. And I'm sure you, you'll start to hear some terms like containers, Kubernetes, and these kind of things. So uh, I tried to, to, to do this kind of uh, storyboard that starts from the uh, a timeline perspective or historical perspective. How did we start? And then at the end, uh, we, we show actually where are we going and where, where are we heading. So uh, let's start. And uh, I've, I, I always tend to start all, all my webinars with some sort of, of, of a historical view of the technology. Uh, I'm not sure why, but but for me as a as a telco professional, uh, this has been the way uh, to understand many technologies, many former technologies. Like for example, when you study the 5G, you need to understand actually how did we evolve to 5G? What where were the 3G and 4G, and how the 5G uh, made use of these kind of technologies? So uh, I made the same, but uh, for the cloud, and actually it it is starting a little bit early. I mean in the 16s and and 17, but in 16, that was actually uh, the idea and the project to have uh, to have some sort of uh, a computer like can be shared by by by, by multiple entities. Like uh, the idea of having a computer uh, dealt uh, with like a utility, like a public utility, and that was the the, the ARPANET uh, project in in the 69. But uh, the real evolution of the virtual virtualization started with from the 70s. Uh, I remember uh, when I was, I would say, starting the journey, uh, I wanted really to know how, how did things start? I mean, what was the, the triggering point? And by 1972, uh, there was an operating system delivered and uh, announced by IBM called VM. So it's a virtual machine. So that was actually the, the triggering of the virtualization in 1972 by IBM. And then from the 17th to 19, there was a lot of enhancements and we saw the adoption uh, of, of virtualization mainly in, 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 in IT uh, in IT segment in enterprises but by that time uh, the vision or the view for, for telecos adopting cloud was not there uh, due to the fact that uh, telecos in the 19 they were all running legacy technologies like fixed the networks and this kind of ATM and frame delay. In 1999, uh, we started to see the evolution of public clouds. So uh, we started to see the concept of software as a service, like someone is providing a certain software on demand, cloud-based. Uh, we, we saw the rise for Salesforce, providing Salesforce as software, and AWS, Netflix, iCloud, Orca Cloud. So that's actually the evolution part of the, of the public cloud. And then in 2012, that was actually, um, I would say, the year of the teleco that was a very remarkable year in the in the in the, the telco cloud uh, I would say a timeline 
uh, we were, uh, we had the first ETSI NFV white, pa white paper. That was a white paper issued by ETSI, European Telecommunication Standardization Institute, about the need to adopt the virtualization techniques in teleco. So you see from a timeline perspective that this kind of technology or the cloud or the virtualization, it landed on the teleco domain a little bit late, right? And, and that justifies why um, we, what, once we started to adopt the cloud and virtualization technologies in teleco, uh, we found many voices in the market that guys, this had been all there. We had, we had been using that in, in IT and that's normal because even from a timeline perspective, we had like 10 or 15 years lag uh, behind uh, using virtualization in IT and enterprises. Uh, in 2015, uh, and maybe colleagues working on the NFV InterCloud know that, that's actually, that was the rise of the deployments where most of the operators started to uh, test and embrace the, the NFV uh, uh, ecosystem or framework. And um, we start to see many cloud deployments uh, based on NFV and maybe it was based on OpenStack and for sure VMware uh, was there as one of the main, com main uh, I would say, competent uh, software leaders b by that time. But even VMware themselves, they, 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 they actually uh, provide some sort of flavor of OpenStack, the VIO. So we saw the rise of, open, of using OpenStack uh, in Telco Clouds. And by that time, Telco Cloud was only providing uh, infrastructure as a service, and we will explain that. And then lately, uh, with the rise of the 5G, and with the rise of the concept of the uh, cloud native functions, CNFs, we started more and more cloud uh, native adoption. We started to see the rise of, of Kubernetes like uh, solutions offering a CAS and PaaS uh, for, uh, for teleco applications. So that's, that's the timeline. You can easily interpret that technology landed on telecos a little bit late, but as you see, uh, we are starting to be there. We are starting to adopt more and more uh, cloud native uh, deployments, and that's what we are going to explain in the next slides. Um, away from, from the common, uh, I would say, definitions of a private and public cloud and hybrid cloud, uh, we have an existing cloud stacks in, in, in the teleco uh, environments. These are the, the brown environments there in the telecos currently. So mainly uh, in any teleco environment or CSP, uh, you'll find uh, a flavors of these clouds. First one is the IT cloud, and that's uh, the most well-established private cloud in any CSP environment. That's actually the cloud hosting the IT application, uh, ho hosting some internal like messaging systems, uh, databases. And for, for the last, I would say, uh, 20 years, uh, VMware has been like a very competent provider for this kind of clouds. And you find like not maybe in the last 10 years, the rise of the enterprise cloud, which means like CSP it, uh, himself or itself, providing public cloud services for enterprises, uh, any kind of SaaS, PaaS, and that can be like um, merged with some offerings with, with the major public cloud providers like AWS and Google, but sometimes uh, CSPs, especially in the, in the Middle East region, they, they themselves provide enterprise services for, for, uh, for their customers. And then, uh, as I said in the last slide, in 2015, we saw the rise of Teleco Cloud, which is, which is actually a flavor of a private cloud in, in, in a CSP environment, but uh, adopting and adhering to the ATNV architecture, and we will explain that. And it was there mainly to uh, onboard and entertain the, uh, we say, like the... Uh, consumer VNFs, like uh, Teleco VNFs, like core, VAS, is transport and security. And you may find multiple stacks also exist in, in, in any CSP, multiple private clouds, maybe some teams, departments have their own stacks. So at the end, uh, if you assess uh, the cloud footprint in any CSP, most probably there will be like these kind of three uh, stacks, IT, Enterprise, Telco, and also you may find other private clouds existing on a, on a CSP. So for Teleco Cloud, and as I said, in 2012, that was the white paper from HCNFV that we, that it was an ask and, and a message to the community, Telco community, that we need to adopt 
the virtualization techniques adopted in the IT because of many motivations, CAPEX and OPEX and service lifecycle management, bringing the agility. So the concept was easy, right? It was the idea of actually decoupling the network functions from the proprietary hardware and allowing them to run in a, in a software environment. For example, you don't have to run uh, network function from Huawei on Huawei hardware or Ericsson network function on Ericsson hardware. You can start to bring COTS, relatively cheap hardware, having some sort of hypervisor or virtualization layer, and then running these network functions in a virtualized uh, environment. That was a concept, right? But, but if telcos just did that, that was simply the VM stuff or the IT stuff. But because we telco, we love standards, we love to put standards and reference architectures. In 2012, right after the white paper from HCNV, we came, or the telco community came with the HCNV architecture, the well-known HCNV architecture. And as I, I said, it was published in 2012. That was actually the first publication uh, in the HCNV uh, industry specification group. So um, I'm sure most of us know, know this uh, architecture. Uh, but mainly it was it had two parts the manual part which is the management and orchestration and it brought new functional blocks like vim vnfm and nfvo and uh, the other part which is actually the managed parts which is the nfvi and the application and the element management and whatever they're existing in the csp environment but it's the nfv were really focusing okay on some parts uh, because by that time, ETNFV was only concerned about infrastructure as a service. Okay, so they didn't care a lot about the application itself. Uh, and I always give this example. If you are hosting, for example, an IMS, a virtual IMS uh, on a telco cloud, and this virtual IMS is contributing to a voice over LTE service, and then at the time, there, you find that there is a degradation in the quality of service of, of a voice in a certain area. This kind of service aspects, HCNV doesn't care about it, okay? Because these are very related to the application. And that's why you see the gray parts. HCNV was totally agnostic to the application itself, to the existing uh, functions like the element management systems, doing FCAPs, any kind of OSS assurance systems. This was not under the governance of HCNV, but HCNV provided very good uh, framework uh, for the interactions between NFVO and the VNFM. So you get a lot of uh, logics and APIs for uh, VNF scaling, server scaling, VNF healing, and this kind of things. And when they come to the NFVI, which is the NFV infrastructure, which is the hardware and software, mainly the servers and, and the hypervisor layer, and the VIM, which is the infrastructure ma manager, like OpenStack, like VMware, like anything, they put, they make it limited scope. Limited scope, this means that they put some requirements but, and some information models, but they didn't put actually a specific APIs. Why? Because there were very competent vendors by that time doing that, right? So you don't go to OpenStack and tell OpenStack you have to develop these APIs. No, but you just put requirements and re rely and trust that OpenStack will fulfill. And that's why, for example, in HCNV, you don't find a lot of, you don't find actually any specific APIs for the VIM. The VIM are only setting requirements and asking other partners in the, in the community to, to fulfill. So that was HCNV uh, mindset by that time. We are focusing only on infrastructure as a service. We can give you a framework for lifecycle management, like scaling, healing, onboarding, but we do not touch the, the application or the or the service part. I hope this is clear because that's the borders of, of HCNFV. Uh, I would say till maybe two years back, because two years back they started to talk about CAS and bringing uh, content as a service. But till 2019, for example, that was the framework. With the rise of Telco Cloud in 2015, there were three main deployment models, okay? Uh, CSPs, communication service providers, uh, 
desiring to, to build a telco cloud, they usually adopt one of these three models. The first model is actually, it's, it's actually the single vendor setup. This means that, for example, I have an RFP request for proposal. I'm bringing a core function from vendor X. Then vendor X brings the function and brings the hardware, brings the software, brings the Vim and the VNF manager. So that vendor is actually building a cloud around his own VNF. So uh, this has been always like seen as, as a vendor lock, but sometimes uh, if the operator himself is actually dealing with one vendor, he's, he has one strategic uh, vendor or a strategic partnership with a certain supplier, then it makes sense. But for sure in a multi-vendor environment, that was always seen as, as a vendor lock. Okay, and, but there are many references in, 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 the, in, in the world actually globally that have this kind of references with Ericsson, with, with, uh, with Huawei. So it is there in the market. Uh, second setup, uh, and that was popular by that time in some major tier one operators like AT&T and NT Docomo, that we called it, we used to call it a la carte model. This means that these, they actually select the best of breed uh, components at each functional block, like the best Vim, the best VNF manager, and, and then a separate RFP for the application, separate RFP for the COTS. And they trust that they themselves, by their skills in integration, in development, they have the skills to make all this work. That was very hard to, to follow or to adopt by the other operators in, in all the regions. So that was, that was always seen as a very um, aggressive way of adopting cloud, especially that by that time, telco communities and telco operators, they didn't have actually the experience, even the teams, to manage such a cloud. So that was very aggressive, uh, seemed, uh, seemed aggressive by, by that time. What actually most of the operators started to do, and um, it somehow made sense because of, because of the lack of, of the experience of the, uh, at the operator side, and at the same time, the desire to, to select the best of breed in, in each area, is actually to, to start to build a multi-vendor open horizontal cloud. It had many labels. You can call it multi-vendor, open, horizontal, but rely on system integrator, okay, to make sure that this stuff works together. So it's actually either you, you do RFP, you award it to, S, to system integrator, and then system integrator propose a component and he integrates, or you select the components and then you do an RFP for SI to commit to integrate these components. So we see this a model of the RFP trending, I would say this has been trending for the last three years, that you get a single point of contact, which is the SI, and then the SI uh, communicates back to back with, with all the, with all the uh, suppliers to make sure that this, this uh, stack works and provide an onboarding environment for, for the CNFs. So these are the three uh, teleco deployment models. Next slide, uh, I'm going to show you how did or how are we planning actually to evolve from infrastructure as a service to CAS or container as a service? And I will start with, with something standard from HCNIV and also I will tell you some comments about the adoption and, and the way forward. But uh, before we, we do that, um, I would like to know if you have any questions uh, before I, I continue. Okay, good. So I think we are all fine. So let's continue. So I want you now to uh, think of the timelines. Uh, I got a question. Okay, there's a question about the edge computing. What is the best teleco cloud model? So I have a slide about the edge, okay, because it's, it's considered a step in, in, in the cloud evolution. I mean, how the cloud uh, evolved to cover the edge requirements. So I'm going to answer that at the edge slide. So again, 
I want you now to think of the timelines of many technologies and see how, how they converge together. So we have the 5G, and the 5G timeline is strictly uh, coupled with the 3GPP releases, okay? So we may know that 5G is, is, uh, is bound to, to 3GPP release 15. So uh, 3GPP uh, release 15, uh, it was actually uh, considered frozen, frozen by Q3 2018. Okay, so the 5G concept was there in, in 2018. There were some pilots and tests and done in 2017. Okay, but the, the standards was released and, and considered frozen, frozen, and that's a keyword in 3GPP by the end of 2018. And by that time, all or the majority of the CNF vendors or the 5G core vendors, they said we are going to adopt containers for our solutions. So all our 5GC, 5G core functions would be containerized, like the UPF, AMF, SMF. And till that time, ETNFV were a little bit late. They haven't sh shown us a framework how to embrace such technology. The first step from ETNFV that, that we have seen it publicly uh, happened on 2019. In 2019, they uh, uh, published uh, GRNFV IFA 19. Okay, that's the name of the, of the publication. And you see the name. It's called Report on the Enhancements of the NFV Architecture Towards Cloud Native and Pass. So that was a late move because most of the operators had to draw an architecture and had to adopt a solution to welcome and to onboard the, the pilots and the PUCs for the 5G. And also, in 2019, when you issue a report, actually a report is not um, a specification, okay? It's not a, like, a, you know, in the concept of, the, of, of 3GPP, you have stage one, stage two, and stage three, right? In 3GPP, when you get stage two, you get the, the flows, you get the, the information models. In stage three, you get the bits and bytes, right? In HNV, it is the same. Stage two, you get the flows, the interfaces, the requirements. Stage three, you get the exact APIs. But the report is a very early stage. It's not, it's not something that you can rely on. So in that report, which was late, okay, compared to the technology pace by that time, uh, HNV suggested a new functional block called CISM. I'm not sure if you heard about that or not, but Container Infrastructure Service Management. The CISM, by function, by definition, that maps to Kubernetes-like solution. And why, why I say Kubernetes-like solution? Because most of the solutions in the market are based on Kubernetes, uh, like OpenShift, Tanzo, uh, Anthos for, for uh, Google. So most of them are actually based on Kubernetes. And then they said, OK, we have another concept of called uh, CISI, Container Infrastructure Service Instance. And that maps to the worker nodes, for example, in, in the Kubernetes terminology. And they said, OK, containers, most probably they will run either on bare metal, which is on, on physical nodes, or they can run capitalized, capitalizing on the existing VMs. So we, they will, like you will onboard the container on the VM. So it's a, it's a VM-based uh, onboarding. And they put some sort of, of methodology to map the concept of HNV, like VNF component to a pod and these kind of things. But the problem that, and this is very important to, to interpret in this webinar, that that report was in 2019, but the technology actually started to evolve in 2018 and 17. So it was, it was very late. And because it is report, it didn't tell the community what to follow being a standard. On the other side, the document proposed many deployment options. For example, for example, one of them said that the CISM can actually take the function of the VNFM, or maybe can be part of VNFM, or maybe can be part of the VIM. So there were many deployment options. So that made some sort of confusion on the, on the, at the operator side. How to embrace this technology? When I, when I deploy Kubernetes solution, how do I integrate this solution with my existing brownfield environment? The, also, also the problem that 
By 2019, and after four years of NFV, there were many lessons learned, but unfortunately, the market was already fragmented. Someone tried, someone left, some said that onboarding time takes years, some said we are going to do own app, no, we are going to do open source mono, no, we are going to do XYZ. So the market itself was fragmented. And by that time, some people believe that maybe it is the, the right step not to follow HNV and go to other other ideas, other other references. Uh, me personally, I'm 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 a I'm a I'm, I'm a telco fellow. I, I belong to this tribe, so I I I do believe in HNV because I I actually contributed to HNV and uh, I was there by, by the, at the beginning. But that was the case. Uh, if, actually, if you see the slides on 2019, you'll you'll find many directions, many motivations, many, not 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 a single stream driving the community. The, the things also that impacted the adoption of, a certain, of, of that kind of architecture and why it was not embraced by, by the community, that the container orchestration solution like Kubernetes-like was mature enough to possess a threat to other mono components. For example, what Kubernetes does actually negates what VNFM does because if VNFM is taking care of the last second management of the VNF, well, Kubernetes can do that. It can do scaling, it can do healing, it can do anything, right? So the idea of having an orchestration in that layer gave the, gave the impression that maybe we don't need a VNFM and NFVO. And I'm saying maybe because it's a debatable topic, okay? Also, because of that time, we saw the rise of many startups in all places. We saw many startups in the, in the 5G core. So there are many startups doing 5G core and 5G core in a box. We saw the rise of many startups in, in, the, in the Kubernetes like solutions. We saw the rise of, for example, Robin.io uh, now with, with Rakuten. So this kind of, of players, quick players, they don't usually follow the standards strictly. They want to be more agile to provide solution to the market. But at the end, all these factors that I'm listing impacted the adoption of, 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 of a certain reference architecture uh, for CAS in the HCNFV. And currently, if, if you're talking to, to operators, they don't have really the same desire and same motivation to follow a reference architecture like five years back when the ATN view is booming. So, um, yeah, I hope I, I, I gave the, the full picture about the HC NV perspective to evolve from infrastructure as a service to container as a service. And what were the obstacles and the difficulties by, by that time until now for the adoption of a reference architecture for CAS in HC NV? And to give you uh, to give you a view about how uh, HNV was thinking about that, it was all about analogy. Okay, HNV wanted to capitalize on the existing concepts of of each of uh, of the first generation. Let me say that, uh, and you, you you start to see many diagrams doing modeling. For example, I, I picked this one from IFA forty, uh, which is actually service interface and object model for OS container management and orchestration specification. For example, uh, if you see uh, the concept of MCIO, which is the managed container infrastructure object, you see it's mapped to the VNF component. So people working on, AC, on, on Telco Cloud, on infrastructure as a service, they know the concept of VNF component, right? VNF components construct the VNF. For example, if you have a certain VNF, it has a VNF component doing signaling, VNF component doing user plane, VNF component doing O and M. So the concept of VNF component map to the concept of the MCIO, the new concept of MCIO. And the MCIO P package maps somehow to the VNF package and the VNFD. So they tried to do mapping of new concepts to the old concepts. So you start to see the new terms like uh, CISM, CISM, and that's actually Kubernetes like solutions. You start to see the MCIO, which is actually maps to the new concept of pod or service and that was the original VNF component. The MCIOP, the package itself, how do you package the, 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 the CNF? So in old days, it was a VNF descriptor. Now it's help charts. 
there are other ways of packaging, but helmet chart is, is the most popular. You have the CISI, Container Infrastructure Service Instance, which is the Kubernetes nodes, like the worker nodes, for example. You have the CIR. These are the new terms for HCNV for containers, and that maps, for example, to the image registry in the market. But the idea that HCNV wanted to enforce such analogy, while on the other side, most of the operators, they wanted to go for a clean deployment, a greenfield deployment, and not really coupled with the old HCNV architecture because of the issues faced during real deployment, okay? I'm not saying that this is right or wrong, but I'm just analyzing the market and giving you what is happening on the ground. So I hope it is now clear how HCNV is actually doing this transition and what are the obstacles for the operators to, to follow uh, such uh, architecture. I will, uh, I will stop here for a question and then I will uh, continue. Okay, two questions. First question, what is the position of Kubernetes in NFV? Is it inside Mano or inside the VNF? So this question, actually, this question show the, 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 I would say, let me go to the slide. Yep. This show the issue that we are facing now because the reference architecture was not concrete and it brought multiple deployment options. So there was no one reference architecture to follow. The architecture allowed many options. So from a standard perspective, I cannot say where is the position. I can just draw this poster and then it's up to the service provider or the system integrator to see which integration or which positioning fulfill the requested use cases. But from my experience, because I'm working on that, currently, most of the operators are building new stacks, new greenfield stacks for containers for cloud native deployments. And then uh, the, 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 uh, the Kubernetes like is considered like a southbound in, uh, system that integrates with northbound systems. What, what are the northbound systems? It can be the NFVO, it can be the VNFM, it can be a domain orchestrator, it can be anything. And this is important because now we don't draw reference architecture. We don't do uh, draw a block and then a block and then a block and then we do interfaces. No, you can just draw a message bus. You put Kubernetes on southbound of this message bus. Kubernetes expose services and whatever northbound system can fulfill a certain use case, it can simply consume this service from Kubernetes. So it is positioned in Zamano, but the northbound integration of Kubernetes is not clear. It can be extended to any system according to the use case. Unlike the Vim, for example, the OpenStack, where you know that OpenStack integrates with the VNFM for the indirect mode and NFVO for the direct mode. Uh, other question is asking about the three deployment models of Telco Cloud. Okay. And he's saying that the vendor does not want to implement his solution in another vendor's cloud. So we end up with stacks, with silos from each vendor. Well, that was the case the last five years because, and that was actually the, the, the silo approach. You bring a vendor for some reasons, he doesn't accept to be onboarded on a certain horizontal medical cloud. So you end up with multiple stacks in one environment. That was one of the pain points on the NFV and because, because of the non, uh, I would say, maturity of the VNFs, because of VNFs not being cloud friendly, not being cloud native, uh, being coupled with, with a certain hardware, that was the first generation that uh, vendor X have their own cloud, vendor Y, vendor Z. So you end up with the stacks and this is not actually a cloud. This is a very, uh, I would say, uh, segregated uh, environment. But now the promise is that with the cloud native deployment, with the new generation, you will have like one horizontal cloud that's actually carrying all these workloads without any limitation or, or coupling that a certain workload 
should run on a certain cloud stack. Uh, there are other questions. Uh, Okay, so there are three questions, and again, the questions are very important, so I'm going to just spend five, five minutes on that. What about vendors still have mix between VNFs and CNFs? So currently, most of the market vendors are providing solutions to manage both VNFs and CNFs uh, by the same solution. So it's a hybrid container as a service and infrastructure as a service. So most of the vendors are doing both at one solution now. And then one question about does HC have reference architecture for container CNFs? No, the answer is no. They have a suggested architecture, like a poster, like where I'm posting it now, but they don't have really strong architecture similar to, 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 the, to the first one. They always try to do that mapping between CNFs or CNF concept to the, to the original concepts. For example, as I showed you, they are trying to uh, bring the cnf definition part of the vnfd by doing some mapping between cnf concept and vnf concept but there is no solid uh, i would say reference architecture from hcnfv and unfortunately they were very late uh, even suggesting this kind of framework uh, all vendors now follow etsy standardization or they have their own approach well it's very loose now it's not like the first early days of the hcnfv uh, now, I would say it's the power of the system integrator and the service provider. You draw the architecture, you draw the blueprint, you draw how you want to produce uh, services, how, how do you want to export use cases, and then you ask suppliers to comply. It's not about following reference architecture, it's about following your architecture and your blueprint. This is the most common. Now, let us move forward because uh, things now started to be more interesting. <laughs> So one, one thing more, and it's a very trending now that we used to provide, to provide infrastructure as a service. I showed you that HCNFV didn't care a lot about the applications, but then lately in 2019, we started to see, yeah, we need to provide CAS, right? We need to provide a platform for containers as a service. But what about PaaS? What about platform as a service? What about cloud providing, for example, an API gateway? What about cloud providing a load balancer for CNFs? What about cloud providing performance management for CNFs or maybe root cause analysis? So we are now starting to see that most of Telco clouds are being evolved to provide this kind of pass uh, capabilities. It's very trending and that's a very, I would say, strong entrance for, for the hyperscalers because they do have a huge ecosystem of partners they themselves now positioning their solutions as part of the past. So you get, for example, a certain stack, cloud stack from, from a hyperscaler, let's say AWS. Once you do that, you get a, ho a holistic list of paths that actually helps you to manage your workloads, to provide CNF functionality. And uh, I would say the, fir the first generation in the past was, was only some basic stuff like doing load balancing, doing API gateway, doing fault management, doing performance management. But what is really interesting and in that some past services now started to evolve as a complete CNFs. And when I was preparing for, for this uh, webinar, I, I read this publication from, from AWS that was actually published uh, last month. So in 5G, in 5G uh, core, uh, for people who are actually focusing on the 5G, we have the new network function NWDAF, the network uh, network function, network data analytics function. Okay. And the network data analytics function, it's a 3GPP uh, new functional block. And as you see, I'm writing here that the 3GP specs, the 23501, that's the well known specs for the 5G, and the 23.288, that's the one for the NWDAF. What is interesting? that AWS is proposing their own solutions to fulfill the NWDAF functionality. So as if they are competing with telecom vendors, it's not just they are hosting 5G core. For example, if you see my, my cursor uh, on, on, on 3, you see that the 5, 5G core functions are uh, hosted on something called Amazon EKS. Okay. 
that's the 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 Kubernetes service on the Amazon. So that's that's normal, right? So Amazon is a cloud provider, so it is promoting that we host 5G core functions on EKS, and that's the same case at all suppliers like at uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, at Google, at Red Hat, Mirantis, VMware. All of them are hosting network functions. But what was interesting that now, instead of, of hosting an NWDAF from a telco vendor, they are providing this NWDAF as a pass. So that's the value provided by, by, the, by the modern telco clouds. And actually, AWS is having the same publication for the RIC, the radio, the radio intelligent controller for the ORAN. So it's a new trend in the past that now clouds can actually provide some sort of of, of, of paths that maps to a certain 5G uh, core function. So I hope now it's clear that, that where, where were we? We, do, we were doing infrastructure as a service. We were doing v, bringing VMs to host application that we didn't care about. And then we evolved to provide container as a service, a platform to host containers. And then now we are providing pass platform as a service that we are providing supplementary service from the cloud platform to fulfill even 5G core functions. That was not the case like a few years back. And me personally, when, when I'm thinking about that, it, it's really a very interesting and a new trend in telecoms that cloud platforms provides pass mapping to a 5G core function. Any questions? Okay, uh, one question about that. The infrastructure as a service model took long time to get to a common adoption by telecos. How much time it may take for the CAS pass to get that maturity? It's a very, very good question. So the infrastructure as a service took almost four or five years for adoption because it was a reference architecture in 2012, and we started to see more and more adoption in 2015, 2016, okay? Uh, the CAS and PASS are very tightly coupled with the 5G for a reason or another. It, it's, it's in the telco an, uh, anatomy, uh, the concept of containerization was very aligned with the introduction of the 5G because that was something mandated by, by the architecture of the, of the new CNFs of the 5G, that they are all containerized. So I would say for all the operators who are actually on the first wave of adopting 5G, they are all building now telco clouds to provide CAS and PASS. And this first wave of operators will make it easy for the others to follow and to adopt. So that's why I expect more adoption and easier adoption compared to the infrastructure as a service, because in the ATNFV in the beginning, only tier one were the pilot. Like you see at and and NT Docomo were the pilot, Telefonica, and walking behind their steps or following them was a little bit difficult because of different of, of the competences and the way they structured the presence of developers. But now all the 5G, most of the 5G uh, operators going for 5G are building a third cloud providing CAS and PASS. This will be, make it easier for the other operators to follow under that. Uh, a question about NWDAF. Can you explain the difference between CAS and PASS for network uh, data analytic function? Another question, how can a network uh, data analytic function for hosting 5G core service benefit the ORAN? So let's, okay, let me answer these two questions. So CAS or container as a service, okay. Uh, you see, for example, let, I hope you, uh, I will try to make the cursor uh, different. Let me use, uh, I hope you can see my pointer. Or the, the, yeah, it's a, it's a laser pointer. So for example, uh, when you see the Amazon EKS, that's, that's their, 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 their enterprise Kubernetes service. So they are providing CAS 
for all hosted workloads. For example, you see the EKS are providing CAS for O&M, CAS for 5G core function, even CAS for the NWDAV uh, 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 analytics function. So they are the hosted platform providing container as a service. Now the pass that you are providing extra service or, or the platform itself is providing extra service for uh, for the for the users or for the end users for example aws is providing the nwdaf as a platform as a service but if they don't provide nwdaf as a service maybe the customer will go and contract uh, vendor x huawei nokia ericsson nec to bring this functionality but because of selecting for example the hyperscaler or aws or google or whatever providing this as a pass now he can rely on the past service on the cloud, not necessarily uh, uh, requiring a telco vendor to provide this service. So that's the difference between CAS and PASS. Uh, the question about how the NWDAF benefits uh, the ORAN, it's actually the same concept the way NWDAF uh, benefits the 5G. It's actually having your decisions as a core functions based on analytics, okay? You know, in the, in the 5G core flow and even in the 4G core flow, to fulfill the call, you need to consult many nodes. For example, in the 4G, you, you used to consult the HSS, right? Uh, you need to consult the PCRF to see what is the policy for the user, to see, for example, uh, what is the, the, the quota for the user for the charging in the OCS. So here in, in the ORAN and mainly in the congestion uh, use cases, you can the NWDAF can integrate with the O and M of the radio to understand the congestion state of a certain cell or a certain area, and based on that conge congestion, it can instruct the radio and the network to do some corrective parts or proactive parts. So it has multiple use cases, and actually before introducing this uh, 5G core function, we used to provide the same functionality by many vendor-specific solutions. So it, it's really good that we have it standardized at the end. For the edge, I'm talking about tel cloud evolution, right? So what tel cloud needs to achieve to provide enhancements, I mean, towards better serviceability, uh, more agile products to, to the market. So with the evolution of the 5G uh, and the 5G SA and uh, the evolution of the use cases related to the ultra uh, uh, reliable low latency, like driverless cars and smart cities, now there is a need that you put your computation power, your cloud toward the edge to fulfill such requirements. And um, we see this kind of, of solutions now realized by, by many suppliers in the, in the, in the market. Uh, and that's what I'm drawing here is actually on the high level logical uh, blocks constructing the cloud edge solution. So you see the cloud offering, they are providing CAS, container service, providing usually uh, IaaS or infrastructure as a service, hypervisor giving virtual machines or containers on top of, of virtual machines. But the most important is the pass, right? The question, question one, one minute ago, we're talking about what NWDAF can provide to ORAN. So this is a kind of pass, like analytics on the edge, that you can provide on the edge to, to fulfill certain use cases relying on the analytics. So any cloud offering on the edge should have this kind of pass. But what kind of pass is it one or two or three actually this is actually what what can brings or what it, but this is the value of the marketplace what is a marketplace that when you bring an edge solution okay to the enterprise for example enterprise edge you need the enterprise user to easily uh, onboard and deploy application that he feels that it makes sense for example you have imagine that you are providing a cloud in a box and uh, because this user is working on the agriculture so your marketplace have many applications related to agriculture or you are positioning this solution for mining so you have a marketplace that have a value for mining and this is the value of the huge ecosystem of partners that work with hyperscalers and work with cloud providers for example, if you have Red Hat, you will have Red Hat with the marketplace from Red Hat. If you have AWS, then you have AWS and the marketplace from AWS. 
So it's not just you deploy 5G core and ran on the edge, but also we, you, you, had, you have the benefit of using the certified partners or the ISVs or the applications provided by, by the cloud provider. So you see the cloud stack really is evolving. It's not about infrastructure as a service. It's not about container as a service. Now we are providing paths. We are providing certified applications to be uh, deployed on demand in what we call in a ZTP, zero touch provisioning. So cloud is evolving, moving towards the edge, evolving from IaaS to CAS to PaaS, even now contributing to providing 5G core functions and also contributing with a huge ecosystem of partners that you can pick and select and deploy in a ZTP fashion. I'm summarizing the takeaways. The, I would say the, the main stuff that, that, that we, as, as a prof, we as professionals need, need, need to, I would say, consider uh, for telecloud evolution. So it's not like the old days. We don't focus a lot about reference architectures like the old days we used to do in teleco, because even now the 5G reference architecture is a service-based architecture. So you have, you have a message bus, you have multiple functions exposing and consuming services. And we should think of the, 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 same, the same in cloud. We should think about exposing service and capability versus thinking in reference architecture. If you have a Kubernetes-like solution in your network, you don't have to spend a lot of time to ask about, will it integrate with the VNFM? What is the integration with the NFVO? What? No, you have Kubernetes solution exposing service you have a message bus, you have an API gateway, any system can ex consume these this, uh, capabilities or service delivering an, a, a bigger use case or an end-to-end -end use case. That, that should be the mentality. We see now that with the rise of the pass and the evolution of the pass of the cloud, it started sometimes to complement, but sometimes it conflicts. Yani after the webinar, go and search for NWDAF. You will find that Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei providing NWDAF and AWS is providing NWDAF. So there is a potential conflict between the two and we haven't seen that conflict before. It's a, it's a new I would say, thing in the, in, in the telco market. So the old days when you build the cloud, it was the same mentality of, of, of procuring a certain function or a certain box. So it's, it's, it's based on CapEx. You, 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 buy, you buy a certain function, delivering certain service, certain value. But now we see uh, most of the greenfield operators like or the virtual operators, like for example, Dish in, in the US, they are more shifting into OPEX model. Like we partner with Hyperscaler. We go together to the market. We win together, we lose together. So we are reducing the capex in favor of the opex. So this is not a telco mentality. Telco telcos have always been centered about capex, not opex. So to have a cloud native deployment and to avoid the complexity of integrating with the existing stacks, we see that the trend of that is to always try to build a cloud native greenfield stack. For example, if, if you have been doing infrastructure as a service for three years and now you want to do uh, container as a service or pass, maybe it makes sense to have a new stack for, for, the, for, for the container as a service, for the, uh, for the platform as a service, just to avoid the interlocks with, with, with an existing stack that, that is, I would say most probably it has a lot of problems because the reputation is not that good about the previous uh, uh, telco cloud deployments. Also, the edge is a good opportunity to start something new with the new technology, so it's completely decoupled from the existing stacks. Maybe you need some integration with centralized orchestration, but at the end, from cloud perspective, it's a new thing. That's why we see that the edge and the greenfield deployments are actually a very good and sweet spot for cloud native uh, deployments. Um, yeah, I made it. It's it's one hour. Uh, I can look to the to the questions.
I will take one question and then we can have a closure. Okay, I think I, I answered this one. Yeah. I'll just go to the chat and see if there are any questions in the chat. Okay, so uh, yeah, there is one, 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 one very good note from Nuruddin. He's saying that when vendors provide NWDAF as a service, that will be considered as a SaaS, not PaaS. That's a very good question. So if, if you are providing this functionality on, as a cloud-hosted service from a certain hyperscaler, that's a SaaS. But if you as a telco cloud internally providing this functionality for for internal customer like the core team or the IMS team or the radio team, then it's considered internally inside the organization as a pass. But it's a very good catch that this service can be provided as a SaaS from, from, uh, from cloud providers and also can be considered in, uh, provided internally by the telco cloud team to their, uh, to their internal fellows or colleagues or teams as a pass similar concept to to load, load balancing as a service and uh, this kind of things it's, it's a very very good catch uh, one last question about if amazon eks can control signaling like issue or run side eks should be uh should be average and can fully control open run application so there there is a catch here the hyperscalers and cloud providers, they understand the mentality and the requirements of the telco. That's why there are many offerings relies on having the infrastructure on the telecos presence or pops. So you find uh, like AWS WebLens with Verizon as an example. So these kind of infrastructure are, are actually positioned in, on, into the CSPs pops to, to guarantee, first of all, the delay, the latency, and also to have some governance from, from the telco CSPs. Um, I would like to, to, to thank you really about uh, for, for your engagements and your comments. I hope it was an uh, interesting uh, webinar and not, not that boring. Uh, I tried to, to explain the end-to-end -end picture and the stages of the cloud evolution. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to reach out to me. And, and thanks again. I, I, really, I really appreciate it. And thanks, thanks for all who come.